brothers and sisters, as we again return to our studies in Judges chapter 5, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance so that we may more clearly understand that which he would have us to know for this time in this earth's history. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, our need of you is great. Please be with us. Please direct us. Help us to understand that which we are about to read. We thank you for this opportunity to join together, to open your word, to seek to understand that which you would have us to learn. We ask, Father, for the guidance of your spirit. We ask as we assemble that angels may surround us so that our minds may be clear and that we may be open to understanding the new truths that you put before us. We thank you for this. We ask, Father, for your blessing. Direct us now for this. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So as we were closing yesterday, we were looking, we had just finished going through Judges 5.23. And we were beginning to work through the blessings that are given in reference to JL, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Now, is JL representative of a church? And if, if so, is she representative of those in the movement that are choosing to continue to study to assess other truths that had not come out since July 18th. Amen. So if this is the case, then the blessing that comes upon JL is above that of other churches or other movements that may be part of our movement today. For we know that there are many that, that choose to speak in reference to the charts. We know that there are many truths upon the charts that are at best lightly regarded. But JL, this mountain goat, gives us an inkling of the path that we should be walking upon. Now, okay. Yeah, well, you have these two different, you have a cursing and a blessing, right? Okay. So these are contrasts of two different groups. Would they not be? Please explain. Well, you have the one group that's not interested in souls, not really interested in studying. They receive a curse. Because uh, they came not to the help of the Lord, the help of, um, uh, what does it say here? I can't see that for one reason. Okay, so. Do the help this, of the Lord against the mighty. Okay, but this portion with Miraz that you're referring to, mm -hmm. isn't this 
referring to the stanza that occurred just prior to the one that we're dealing with here with JL. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when we're looking at that, is that giving a curse to those that would be part of the movement or is that giving a curse to another group? I think it's a group that's part of the movement. Okay. I mean, I'm always taking this as being about the movement, not anything outside the movement. Okay, so when we're looking at that, <clears throat> where we started on that portion was in Judges 519. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain from money. So this is re the, these kings then are representative of those that are not choosing to study in a proper manner. Well, the kings of Canaan. So these are the enemies of of the message, right? These are the enemies that were allowed to exist to test and prove us, because that's how we okay. think all of these about judges. And so we're going to have um, a group of people that is not um, going to come to the help of the Lord, and they're going to be characterized by Maraz. Okay. All right. So, so that would be people within the movement that did not stand up against this error, and 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 actually, in a sense, have bought into it. Right. So. Okay. So let's return to that entire entire section so that we we more fully see this, and then we'll come back to Judges five twenty four. So let's examine what Theodore is saying. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. And the following verse, they fought from heaven, the stars in their courses or the stars in their paths fought against Sisera. <clears throat> So when saying they fought from heaven, that this is God and his angels that are fighting from heaven against Sisera? Well, no, it's just a symbol of, of his people and, and, and also the stars in their courses. So well, I'm taking this as dealing with chronology again. Okay, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm asking, I ask it literally. So if I ask it symbolically, there's a message that fought against Sisera, against those that would choose to allow inroads of a false message. Yeah, so to the ones that fought from heaven, the stars in their courses, this is a symbolic of, of the part of the message that has defeated the message of Parminder. Okay, so this is the message, <clears throat> the message and the interpretation, the interpretation as given by Miller's rules. That's okay. fighting against Parminder and that which he was seeking to introduce into the, into the movement. Yeah, and then you have a group of people that really aren't supporting uh, this fight against Parminder. All right. Right, so, so we saw this. I mean, all through, at least in my experience, um, of what was happening in the area of chronology, is you didn't have a lot of support for it. Even when we made the July 18 prediction, there was a large number of people in the movement who did not support what was happening. 
and most of them just stayed quiet. You know, they waited to see what was going to happen. You know, time would tell, so to speak. When the prediction didn't come to pass the way that they expected, most of them just turned on, you know, many of them just left the movement. But many of them still stayed in the movement for whatever reason. Same reason why people stay Seventh-day Adventists when they don't believe the 2300 days. It's never made sense to me. But there are people who don't really support what we're studying right now. And yet they're still in the movement. So that would be those that received this curse. They did not come to the help of the Lord to help the Lord against the mighty. And then the contrast is going to be JL. Okay. Now, when we see this next verse, 521, the river of Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon, O my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Mm -hmm. Now, we have Kishon mentioned twice, but separated by a description the ancient river. Is this yet referring to Kishon in three different points? Because mm -hmm. it's winding and right. it's, age, it's ancient. Okay. So who's behind that? I mean, it's, it's a satanic message. Okay. So the winding ancient message like that, that we saw in Eden mm -hmm. is being represented, it is given a representation by this message that has come into the movement that is not of God and is not of Miller's rules. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and it's it's not recognizing the light of the midnight cry. It's not recognizing the way that the Lord has led us. Then were the horse hoofs broken by the means of the prancings or the tramplings, <clears throat> the tramplings of their mighty ones. So here we have another representation of Islam. Would that be correct? Well, definitely it can be. But if this, if this message that is not correct is not recognizing the method of study as presented by Miller's rules, would it also not set aside much of what the pioneers had understood such as the import of Islam to the message and the message of the midnight cry. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure necessarily that, you know, the horse hooves here have to do with Islam. Okay. But, I mean, it could be. Um, the, the important thing here is these, uh, these tramplings. And, and that's based upon the word, uh, the reason why it's translated as, as tramplings, I believe, by uh, because it means to gallop, but it also has the word broken there. Right. Which means to strike down or to stamp or to beat down. So the idea is that it's beaten down by galloping. So that would be trampling. Okay. So the horse hooves aren't really broken. Uh, the horse hooves are doing trampling. Okay. 
I don't know if you can apply that to Islam here. <clears throat> I'm just a I'm asking the question. Yeah, because it's a possible application. Right. Yeah, I understand. That. So, so I'm just saying based upon the sentence itself, I don't see how Islam had done that. Okay. Now, is there anything else there that we could we could address? Any other point that we might see in this verse? I think that tramplings could also mean beating out the, the word like threshing, threshing grain. Okay. Well, so as you've done in the past, Theodore, mm -hmm. if we're looking at 522 in the Hebrew, you pointed out yesterday that this horse hooves was two words, one of which being Seuss. Mm -hmm. which is from an unused root meaning to skip for joy mm -hmm. as a horse that is leaping so yeah horse that is leaping yeah so okay So at this at, at this junction, the second word, Ikeba or Akaba, meaning a heel or figurative figuratively the rear of an army. Mm -hmm. Now those that bring up the rear are normally those that protect. The rest of the army. Yeah. So. Well, and, and it has this liar in wait, right, is relating to it as well. <clears throat> well, I'm I'm asking that we we consider the first the first portion before we get to a liar in wait with this. Okay. Because what if this with the horse hooves is symbolically those that will give the final message? That they leap for joy that this message is now going out in its purity. Okay. Well. Is that possible? I, I don't think so. Okay. I, I don't see that that I don't see that interpretation. Because you got the Kaishan River River swept them away. Right. And then were the horse who's broken by means of the prancings, the prancing. To me, this is about the gossip that has gone on in this movement. That's that's what it's about. Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just taking these in consecutive order. So I'm asking if the Kaishan River occurs first and then this with the horse hooves is an occurrence after no. Kishan has swept the others away. Okay, yeah. So I see them as, as just parallel talking about the movement. I don't see them as progressive steps. Okay. <clears throat> Now, in the chat, reference was being made to the Song of Solomon. Why? What it, thoughts do we see here? In there, it talks, yeah, it talks about the beloved being like a young heart upon the mountains. Okay. Okay. 
And then Ibex is like a heart. If it isn't a heart, I'm not sure. Uh, well, a heart Ibex. is a deer. One's a deer, the other is um, an Ibex. A goat? Sure, exactly what that is. I, I think goat would be a better, a better term, yeah, because one would be a deer, the other a goat. Yeah. But it's also quite a different context dealing there with the Song of Solomon. Well, they're leaping for joy. And you were mentioning leaping for joy, and those verses came to me. So okay. I think there's a connection. Yeah, I, I see this as more about backbiting. Judges 5:22. Well, yeah, I had first said that reminded me of Dan who bit the horse's heels. Yeah. So I think right here we're looking at two meanings. There's a contrast between those that would undermine and attack from the rear and then those that are rejoicing because the truth is really being manifest in us and being expressed to those who need to hear it, which is everybody really. Okay. So then we come here to Kershi Miraz, said the angel of the Lord, Kershi bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to, to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Right. And the mighty are, are referred to as above as well. Right, so the mighty had been uh, the ones who, however, the mighty ones here. I don't, I don't think. Uh, well, because the mighty here are are not the good guys, right? In both the, because you got the mighty in the verse above, and you have the mighty here, right? Right, correct. So, so these are. <clears throat> Um, those who exalt themselves. I mean, it's related to, it could be an angel, I mean, can be referred to. So there's some kind of leader. Um, uh, but you have here, uh, the word is abir, which means an angel, a bull, the chiefest, the mighty one, stout-hearted, strong one, valiant. So, but in this case, this is not God's, in the context here, it's not God's people. I mean, this is the mighty in the sense of their leadership. Okay. So, <clears throat> it's the mighty in the sense of their leadership, not the mighty in the sense of a message. Yeah. I mean, there's a message involved. But, I'm you know, not disagreeing. Because you have Sisera. I mean, he would be one of the mighty in this context. So, I mean, it's definitely referring to a message. That, <clears throat> okay. That there are people who are not supporting the true message. They're supporting the false message. Just by not helping, they're supporting it. I guess the thing that bothers me the most is there are people who see what's happening but never speak out. They never want to be uh, uh, counted, even though they, they know what the message is, they know when they see error, but they're never going to be vocal about it. Um, they might give me support when I talk to them, or they might even email me and give me support. But they continue to allow uh, character assassination to occur and never say anything about it during meetings. You know, so being quiet, being silent, uh, you're participating in that action. Right. And that's what I think Morose is representing. Okay, now, when we're looking at this,
in this in this particular situation, there's not much of a definition of Moroz or Moroz. Yeah, there's no idea really. Now, does any of the other references like Ground Driver Briggs or any of the others have any kind of definition of Moroz? No, uh, other than refuge, that's a guess. But um, but they just say it's uncertain derivation. So so maybe a refuge, but well, could this could this be their refuge in the wisdom of man? Could be. I, I just think they don't know what it means. Okay. I checked the Bible dictionary. Yes, sir. But I have, and uh, I do think it had said refuge as well. But it has something else, but I can't remember it. I don't well, Hitchcock, it. Hitchcock says uh, secret or leanness. Um, yes, I think that was the other aspect. Yeah, of it. yeah, yeah. refuge and leanness. Which I'm not sure that the, they even connect. Well, <clears throat> a lean message is not one that presents things to really into a good outcome. I mean, it's just, it, it's there, yes, but it's not, it doesn't seem to be an appealing message is what I'm trying to get at. And if this is to curse a, a refuge, especially in, in a symbolic light, we've seen many times over the years, including with what's been going on with Parminder, where men's intellect has been lifted up over the plain understandings of the word of God. That's just an observation. So yeah. the thing is, this place was on the path that they had to pass. Okay. It was on their way, but the people of Miraz did not help them. Okay. So that's why it's mentioned. Okay. So now we're back here in stanza number seven. Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. Blessed are those that seek to understand the message of July 18th. Would that be a fair way of approaching this? Because if, we, if we're applying this as those that are joining together as a church, that JL represents a portion of the movement that is continuing to study and rely upon the methods presented by God through Father Miller. Would that be a fair approach? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this is just the contrast. Now, I, I still take the tent as referring to uh, the particular part of the message dealing with the understanding of chronology and the application of dates and times and spans, especially after July 18th. Okay. So prior to December 6, 2020. So we started to look at 
things after the July 18th prediction um, that should have been understood by this movement, but people didn't want to hear. And we continue to have light unfold, and we still do, in regard to these spans of times and these dates. So that's. So I would definitely think it refers to the part of this message that is still looking for light from July 18th. Okay. Now, <clears throat> he or Sisera asked water and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. What symbols can we take from this? I mean, it's it's interesting <clears throat> because of the way that this word water is presented in the Hebrew. The word being Mayim, Hebrew 4325. And there's many euphemisms that are applied to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's the nor normal word for water, mayim. I mean, uh, you know, can refer to the to seas as well. Okay. To the water. Um. <clears throat> so he asked for water. She gave him the richness of the kind. So she gave him that of cattle. What are cattle representative of? And then why, why would it be said that she brought forth butter in a lordly dish? Well, so if we take this as a message, right. um, so this is referring to Sisera and, and to a message that is asking just for water. Now, I mean, I mean, she didn't really bring him butter. She brought milk, but it's going to use this in this poetic uh, language to refer to it as butter, that is, milk can be turned into butter, right? And of course, this could be, you know, curdled milk or cheese, it could be you know, cottage cheese or butter, right? Um, and this would be something, I don't know if anybody's ever made butter, but it comes about by churning cream. Right. Right. So my grandfather used to make butter. Um, now, so, so the question, I guess, here, um, is this some kind of method of study, taking the word, you know, being the sincere milk of the word, God's word, and and sort of processing it and presenting well, it in a, in, in, a, in a way that it can be understood. In this situation, 
as you just pointed out, butter is normally made through the churning of the cream. Mm -hmm. So butter is the higher fat, the more fat. Well, putric acid. Okay, but what I'm getting at is that when you were pointing out how one part of this was lean, you would not see lean where it comes to butter. No. So where it comes to the butter, you're coming to a, a message that is rich and does not leave one in a lean condition. So it's a message that fills out the figurative person. Would that be a fair assumption? Um, figurative person? Well, I mean, we're, we're trying to deal with this as being a message. We're trying to deal with this as figuratively okay. as possible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is presented in a large dish, a wide or powerful uh, dish. Right. Yeah, it's, it, it's something that's presented not just in a, in a shallow manner. Mm -hmm. It's presented with a lot of depth. Yeah, it's rich and deep. Um, right, so there's this uh, message. The message of JL is a deep, rich message. And then we have in verse 26, where she put her hand to the nail, the right hand to the workman's hammer. Okay, so she put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer, she smote Sisera. She smote off his head <clears throat> when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it say that she she hammered off his head. It right. does state that she took a nail, a nail of the tent, and put it through his temples. Yeah, well, the Hebrew just says crush, but it can be, mean smite off. At least that's the way the King James translators translate it. Okay. So I don't think that it's actually saying she smote off his head. I think that he crushed his head when she pierced. Um, so that word pierce also means like to dash. So it's actually based on the same word. Um, to dash asunder, to crush or smash or violently plunge. Um, figuratively to dis subdue or destroy. And, and then stricken through. Um, <laughs> uh, means properly to slide by, that is, by implication, to hasten away, pass on, spring up, pierce, or change. So it has lots of different meanings, abolish, alter, cut off, go forward, grow up, etc. But the idea here is that um, she's putting this nail through his head with a hammer. So does this reference back to Genesis 3? Um, so the serpent bruising the heel? What? Or, or, or are you talking about uh, with the serpent bruising in the heel and Christ crush, crushing the head? Correct. That's, crushing the head is what I'm getting at. Yeah, 
But we already had before about the horse's heels, which Angela had tried to go back to Genesis 3. And so maybe you could say, based on this imagery, that you know she could be right, that there is this connection here. The heel and the head are mentioned in this in this um, contrasting sections. Okay. <clears throat> so the message of JL puts her hand to the nail, to the spike of the tent. Yeah, so, so when you have um, Isaiah 22, I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. It's the same word. And he shall be a glorious throne to his father's house. Okay. So that's, that's the one dealing with uh, he will shut. He, he can uh, shut. No man will open. He can open. No man will shut. The key of David is connected there. And that's quoted in Revelation. Um, so this nail, of course, is, is ultimately one of the things that we see. When we deal with these structures, so, you know, we often don't focus on this, but when we're dealing with these structural chiasms and these repeats of history, we know that the chiasm that's ultimately the center of all things is the cross. Right? All right. But then the cross is a chiasm in a number of ways. It's a chronological chiasm in that you got the baptism of Christ and the stoning of Stephen and the cross in the center. But you also have the two thieves, the one that's saved and the one that's lost. So Jesus is crucified between two thieves. So that's a, a chiasm. Um, so the message here, uh, when we look at uh, what we're doing with all this chronology, I mean, ultimately what we are doing is experiencing the cross. All right. Right. It's not just that we're, you know, looking at events and finding interesting coincidences of dates and spans of time. But we're actually going through an experience in this movement, which is a parallel experience to experiences of those in the scriptures, including Christ on the cross. And as so this Christ, day, the, the cross of Christ is the thing that Parminder has basically denied. Well, Parminder was lifting up a false narrative, a false message. Hmm. Which was a denial of the cross of Christ. Agreed. And it was the religion of fun and games, of fellowship and parties and... You know, it's the world. It was the ultimate peace and safety message. Mm -hmm. There is no Sunday law. Um, you know, the world is correct. We can, you know, watch CNN and and just go along with the crowd, and and we're we're saved. Okay. But in, in these symbols, here, here, she put her hand to the nail. So the message of JL, the message of this part of the movement, takes a major point, a pin of the tent. So she has nail in one hand and workman's hammer in the other. With the hammer, she smote Sisera. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. Now, this is giving a picture of one that 
if this is all part of a message that ends that message, that, that it ends the false message that was being presented. Mm -hmm. Would you have a, any difficulty with that type of analogy? No. At her feet, he bowed, he fell, he lay down. At her feet, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. <clears throat> now, rather than at her feet, it's between her feet in the alternate Hebrew. But it's interesting that this is, is being repeated in the manner in which it is. So what are we seeing by such a repetition in verse 527? What does it say to the, to the message, to the movement right now? In the chat, Ezra 9, 8 is being referred. Why? It refers to the nail again. It says, and now for a little space, grace has been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place. The tent is a sanctuary, a holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Yeah, yeah so that fits with Isaiah 22. 20. Exactly. And Revelation 3, where it talks about the wicked coming and bowing before our feet, if you're talking about you know, the bowing or between her feet or at her feet. So at her feet, he bowed, he fell. <clears throat> you generally don't look at one bowing as being one that fell or laid down. At her feet, he bowed, he fell. So is this, <clears throat> is this another Hebrew chiastic structure? What can we do with this portion of the verse? How does it relate to our application of this being a message? Okay, so bowed, kara, to bend the knee by implication to sink, to prostrate, to cast down, to become feeble, to stoop, to subdue. And then when it says he lay down, you can lie down for rest, or this is one that would decrease.
have we seen the message, the false narrative presented by Parminder begin to decrease at this time? Mm -hmm. How? Well, I mean, do you see anything about Parminder? Can you find even any information? Very, very little. It's it's strange when you, if you do a, a deep dive, yes, you can find a lot. It just doesn't come up the way it used to. Right. And, and they're, the people in their movement aren't doing anything to promote it. Um, with those that are in the movement, at least. Right. So. And, and if you look on their Facebook pages, the ones that I'm friends with, they have almost nothing about their message on there. If, if some of them have nothing about it, even though they're still in the movement. Okay. Like they might make some comments on some news stories that shows that they're liberals, but, um, you know, they're not putting the videos up and promoting people to watch them or anything like that. Well, they really don't have to promote it much because if it's still going along the track that it was back in 19, say, they can, anybody who seeks them can seek the same kind of crap from the world. Well, that's true. But yeah, the, I mean, I, I'm not really, they're, they're very much have internalized what they're doing. That is, they, they're just, he's just trying to keep the people that he has. To me, it's like uh, an insular cult. Like Jim Jones? Yeah, like that type of thing. Because Jim Jones relied on the cult of personality. Hmm. You must follow Jim Jones because he is the leader. Because that, that, he, yeah. keep going. Well, that's what Parminder's doing. Yeah. There are those that would say that those of us that are in the movement that have followed and studied as Elder Jeff had presented that we are also in an insular cult. Well, but the one thing that I always appreciated with Elder Jeff was that he was always very direct. Don't take my word for it. Study for yourself. Yeah, well, that's the whole thing. Amen. Oh, you know, like we don't really have a leader. We don't have somebody who that we are following. Uh, yes, we do we, have a leader. Our well, leader Christ. is Christ. Yeah, but you know what I'm like saying, a human leader. And there is nobody with any authority. We don't have any structure. I mean, Parminder's a movement. People have to confess their sins to him. Um, you know, I mean, it's they have to obey him. I mean, one of the things that was really strange, not that we want to go on talking about Parminder, but just that illustrates this was a lot of the African brethren who were following Parminder, they referred to people who are older than them as elders. Uh, but they were commanded not to refer to anybody as an elder unless they've been ordained as an elder in the movement. Wow. Well, I, I just thought that was a very strange uh, order from Parminder. Very, very different. Mm -hmm. So in this situation, the message taking a pin of the tent, then destroys the reasoning of the message that is represented by Cicero. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, by following Miller's rules, by understanding the cross, I mean, this is a comprehensive message that we have because it's Adventism. Really, what, what we're teaching is Adventism in its, because everything that we're doing supports what's already been established. And Parminder's message cannot challenge that. I mean, that's one of the reasons his followers are not uh, to, dis to talk with me particularly. Um, but with people in this movement. It's interesting that <clears throat> this is being said not only by those that are following Parminder, but by those that are choosing an enforced separation right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because people need to be able to study and discuss things and to check things out, whether they're so or not. Um, so this idea that just of shunning people um, and warning people not to talk to somebody or misrepresenting them or whatever you want to do, um, rather than actually addressing what's being taught itself, is a problem. So, so then you have the mother of Sisera. Who would that be? Verse 28. So we come to this last stanza, the eighth stanza of this song. So the mother of Sisera. Well, if Sisera is the representation of a false message and a female is a church, mm -hmm. Would this, would this mother of Sisera be the source of the false message? Yeah, this has to be the Catholic Church. Okay. Because his message is uh, Catholic. Well, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest this in... The, the way that the pioneers would have said this. Okay. This is the Romish church. Mm. Yeah, the Romish church. Because if, if we take the definition of Catholic. Which means universal. Correct. I would rather place it as the Romish church to be more specific. Mm -hmm. Now, we know the traditions that are steeped within the Romish church. So here, the mother of Sisera, the, as we're applying it, the church from which Sisera, the message of Sisera had come, looked out a window. Why are they looking out a window? They're waiting for the arrival of the, shall we say the benefit or the fruits of their message. And cried through the lattice, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why is this message not returning fruit? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Now this uh, window, which means, uh, according to Brown Driver Briggs, um, is, is the piercing of the wall. Okay. Chalon. So, um, so in this case, when we think about the wall, we think about God's law, and and the breach in the wall is the, the Sabbath. 
Well, okay, but turn this back to this message. Okay. The breach in the wall of the false message. And the breach in the wall, which allowed the prophet to see into the secret chambers where there are all kinds of animals and idols on the wall. So it's spiritualism. It's the imaginations of evil hearts. So you're refer there you're referring to Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel. Exactly. Okay, so. And regarding the Catholic Church, I, I agree totally because I remember that Jesuit training. We were not to have any fellowship with any other church, Holy Mother Church only. You set foot in a Protestant church and take part in their services, you're damned to eternal hell. So I'm going with the symbolism that you're both using, but I'm applying this to the Romish church, not, not to God. So I'm asking is if this, the, the message that of the destruction of Sisera is also not a message that pierces the wall of the false Sabbath and all of these other symbols that have been held up as being relevant within the Christian church. Okay, so this would be um, because you have a tarrying time here as well. The question of how long, right? Um, and cried through the lattice. That's cried out through the lattice, right? Um, why is his chariot so long in coming? Uh, the chariot referring to. Um, Like, like a wagon, a millstone, there's lots of things it can be by analogy, a rider or the cavalry, right? So it could be, you know, looking for deliverance. I, I don't know um, well, how we will apply that. When we, when we look at this in the book of Revelation, we know that, that this message this Romish church is going to come to an end. It is not going to be part of the kingdom to come. Right? Mm -hmm. Does not the false precede the true? Yeah. Here we have a cry. We have a cry through the lattice, through the window, through the breach of the wall. Asking why. At the end, you have a group that does not agree and hold to the false narrative and the false message. They are the ones that are sought to be destroyed. Yet by seeking their destruction, this false message comes to its end. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So her wise ladies answered her, yea. She returned answer to herself, or she returned her words to herself. So her wise ladies of the mother of Sisera, 
who are the wise ladies that can be applied here? Well, these here are mistresses, and wise here can mean cunning. Symbolically, though, what what would what these cunning women be? Are well, they we, not are they not churches that would support yeah. the Romish message? Yeah. Yeah. How else can we see it? Well, that's the way we would see it. I don't think you could see it any other way. So in Judges 5.30, have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every man a damsel or two? to Sisera, a prey of divers colors, a prey of divers colors of needlework, of divers colors of needlework on both sides, meet for the necks of them that take the spoil. What's so important about the divers colors? What symbol can we apply here? I mean, the translators gave reference here to Exodus 15, 9. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Is this not from the Song of Moses? Mm -hmm. So, when Pharaoh hastily left Egypt to pursue the children of Israel. Have they not sped? Mm -hmm. Have they not speedily given a message? Have they not spread this message throughout the movement and throughout the world? Have they not divided the prey? Are those that are choosing not to fully study, not the prey of our adversary? To the head of a man, a damsel or two. To Sisera, a prey of divers colors. Why is this repeated three times? I mean, I can I can see the representation of a person being a prey. I can see the representation of an animal being a prey, of a city being a prey. But why are divers' colors a prey? So in the chat, it suggested that we contrast this with Psalm 45, especially verses 13 and 14. Why? I'll read it here. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king 
In raiment of needlework, the virgins, her companions that follow her shall be brought unto thee. And I'm also thinking of character, but on a, on a, in a worldly way, diverse colors as in the pride flag. Okay. But this king's daughter being arrayed in the way that, that this was being described in Psalm, um, this is not like the wedding garment provided by Christ. There is always a counterfeit. Yeah, I, I don't see this as applying to the LGBTQ community or anything like that. I mean, I, I'm not even really sure but why. Where is Rome going? I mean, you can listen a little that I do hear Francis speak, and he's a, pretending to embrace everybody. I mean, he is yeah. the epitome of what the Omega movement wants right now. I know, but I'm just saying, understanding the sentence, it wouldn't make sense. Um, Um, I mean, one is it, it, it wouldn't really be referring to diverse colors. I mean, it just means something dipped or colored cloth. Um, so. Well, I know they don't want the coat of, of, of Joseph. I mean, they envy it, they covet it, but they covet heaven, but they don't understand how to get to heaven. I was a Catholic for 14, 15 years. I mean, I know what I was taught and I'm, ah, I'm just so frustrated that people could fall for this. I know, I'm just saying, reading this verse and how we're making application. Um, because this is a, 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 a pray Um, of embroidered work, right? That's the idea. Cloth that's embroidered. Um, Proverbs 31, too, it talks about, about the faithful church, the faithful woman who also yeah. uses her, uh, her... The words are escaping me. Yeah, but the pray her here ability. is not... But the pray here is not Sisera. The, the pray here or his message, the pray here is something that uh, would be conquered by Sisera. All right. That this would be the spoil. So this would be the conquering of, of another message that, that this mother of Sisera is talking about. So, you know, this would have to refer to this message. Doesn't the Romish church view its message as supreme to all others? Mm-hmm. Doesn't it view its message as supreme even unto the word of God? Mm -hmm. Doesn't it view its method of interpretation of the word of God as supreme to all others? Yes, it does. That's what I was taught. My mother again tried to put that on me. As late as 2003, that's the last time I saw her alive. So then if we're looking at this in this manner, the prey of divers colors is supposed to be a message so beautiful that none can reject it. 
And that's exactly what she said. I just love the panoply and the cerebral qualities of the Roman Catholic Church. But, but I'm saying that this is our message. The praise that's being referred to the needlework would refer to our message, not a counterfeit. Because it's the prey, it's the thing that's going to be conquered. They think they can conquer it. Right. Well, that's the whole point is the mother of Sisera is crying out from the window, you know. And the Vatican has more spies and more means of, you know, collecting info on us than any other organization on earth. You think I'm not watched? I know I am. She informed the Jesuits about me. She told me so. so. But it's kind of missing the point of how we're trying to understand this is what I'm trying to say. What I'm what I'm looking at at this moment is trying to lay the groundwork as to the different ways that this can be looked at. Yeah, I would just say that this is our message. That is the prey. That's how I would understand it. Because Cicero is going to, uh, you know, that's the idea. Is it's the booty. It's the thing that he would, because um, the word prey and the word spoil are the same word right okay and and wouldn't he have divided this already is what uh the mother of Cicero is saying as she looks out the window have they not Working. divided the spoil to every man a damsel or two um and this is just sure, you, you, you infiltrate this church and you infiltrate that church and you infiltrate that church and pollute it and corrupt it and take it over. And this is happening with SDAism. These Catholics come into and they get an MDiv or whatever, and then they pass through these churches. It's not just, you know, the Pentecostals or the Baptists this is, or whoever. This is talking about Parminder's message, and this is talking about our message. And do you think he wasn't a Jesuit plant? I'm convinced he was. And yeah. I'm also convinced Tess was, or yeah, is. Well, well, they couldn't have be Jesuits because they never went to a Jesuit university. Well, I'm not saying they, but they bought into that message. Yeah, yeah. But they can't be a Jesuit. So where is it coming from? Somebody well, is, is just pulling found, the string somewhere up high. Well, I, I don't think so. I mean, Tess's mom, I mean, she's an Adventist. Tess was raised in Adventist, rejected the message. She has Asperger's. She liked the patterns. She could see patterns. That's why she came into the message. Her mom had been working with Parminder. Uh, we have no, no knowledge that Parminder was trained or had any connection with Jesuits. But his thinking is Jesuit thinking, I would agree. Exactly. But, but that exactly. Jesuit thinking is, is everywhere. I mean, it's, you know, anybody who's, who's, gone to school has been taught to think like a Jesuit. I mean, that's just the Protestant way. So a person doesn't have to be planted as a Jesuit in order for them to do the work of the Jesuit. So I don't think this is some kind of conspiracy on the Jesuits part. It's just some, um, someone has bought, in, your life has has bought into the lie. So yeah, I, I just would not, there's no way that Parminder or Tess or Tess's mom is any way planted by the Jesuits. That's well, all I'm my saying. mother certainly was. Well, she was Catholic. And she worked for them. She slept with them. She promulgated their messages. Mainly right. So that's what I'm that saying. Is that's not the case here in this, in this situation. So we have Adventists who have been deceived and are presenting a false message. I don't know. People have accused me of being a Jesuit, so, you know, I pretty much am sure that I'm not. Never been a Catholic, <laughs> never been connected to the Catholic Church in any way. I did go to a Catholic uh, boys' camp, though, when I was 10 years old. So, you know, so maybe that's where I became a Jesuit. But yeah, maybe, I just maybe, don't, yeah. think, I don't think this is a helpful sort of accusation because it's not based okay. upon anything that can be proven. Is what I'm saying. Plus, that's, that's true. I cannot prove it, but right. someday it'll plus, all come out in the wash. But plus, we also are trying to understand this passage, and I just don't think it's talking about the Jesuits or anything when it comes to this prey of diverse colors. 
or the spoil of divers' colors, because that is what they, the mother of Sisera, is hoping that this message will do. It will, and and when we think of this embroidered, uh, colored work, I mean, this can refer to the sanctuary message itself. Amen. Right. So. So there's no reason to see this as some kind of thing like LGBTQ or anything like that. Because this is- Well, this there are many sides to this and I'm just looking at what's happening in the world right now and what's happening in our movement and what's happening in the Catholic church a little bit. And I'm just seeing, okay, it's the great unveiling. Okay, but we can't have it both ways. We can't have it referred to LGBTQ and also to this message. I say it can refer to both. I'm, if, I'm if I were a world yeah. and I were looking at that and I would say, oh, a standard or a flag of diverse colors, of course I would see it like that. See, I'm, I, I have the gift of being, being able to think like a worldling and think like a Christian and see, okay, this, let's compare this. But, 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 I, but, but you know, like, of course I prefer God's way of looking at things. Okay. But I mean, I've lived with all sorts of people. I've been with so, so many different people and I, I'm getting to comprehend their mindset. And then I try to direct them to, well, let's look at the truth. You know, let's compare this to the word of God and see how it relates to how you're thinking. And then they, yeah. then they see, yeah, there's a contract. There's like counterfeit here. Some of them do. Okay. So if we're looking at these verses and we're interpreting them a certain way, we can't interpret them two ways at the same time. We can't say that this is talking about the Catholic Church as being, you know, the message that we're talking about is our message. It's either referring to our message is this message of needlework, embroidery work. Diverse colors is not really um, the way to translate that passage, but embroidery does imply uh, a variegation of color, right? That is, in order to embroider something, you have to use different colors. You're not going to just embroider something the same color. But this is nothing like a flag, right? This is, I think, referring to this message, which is connected to the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And that, and that the idea here is just this symbolic way of looking at the fact that the message of Parminder. <laughs> is really the Romish, the message of the Romish church, which we saw because they support uh, the papacy, right? This is a good pope, yeah. right? So, yeah. so they just bought into something and, and, and maybe even are unwitting of that fact. But the point they is- They were blatant you know, about it. Francis is a good pope. I Francis understand. is a murderer. Yes. <laughs> But I'm just saying that we, we're looking at this figuratively. We're not going to apply this literally, and we have to we have to follow Miller's rules. And if we're going to do that, then we can't we can't just jump around with different interpretations. It it's pretty clear that the mother of Sisera, the the ideas that have come to Parminder, their origin is the Catholic Church. Right, because that that's that's where it's all come from. All of this type of philosophy and um, this sort of manipulation, the the deceit and honest and an open deceit, right? And also mm -hmm. the demand that the followers follow him. You know, we haven't our message is right. Jeff never taught a message like that, and we don't teach a message like that, right? We use reason. We use scripture, and we, we trust that each person is going to understand truths for themselves. Nobody's going to be shunned or banned or pushed out or censured uh, because they have a different point of view, right? At least they shouldn't. I would hope not. It grieves me that I've seen it elsewhere, and I, I've talked to a couple of the people involved, and I was made to swear that I would not repeat the source. So I'm not going to repeat it. Yeah, well, you should, never, you should I'm never. I'm sure you're never, aware of it anyway. You should never ever I, swear not to repeat something that somebody tells you. Um, and, and, also, and you should never listen to something that somebody tells you that 
you can't. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to find out, Theodore, why certain I people have some curiosity. against you. <laughs> I understand. No, it wasn't curiosity. I was trying. To, I like to try to get to the roots of things. I call me a radical. It means root, right? I wanted to know where all this was coming from, and so I heard this long spiel of stuff. And and then I was defending you as much as I could. I mean, I wasn't present when all this stuff happened. I said, you need to pray for him. If you have an odd against him, you should be addressing it to him directly. Well, we've tried. He never listens and stuff like that. And I said, then pray. Yeah. Well, Just nobody pray. ever comes. Nobody ever. Heart and let God examine and change him where he needs to change. That's all I can do. I mean, I've got enough crap to work on in my own life without yeah, going around trying he, to correct yeah, people. So. Okay. Yeah. So the point is, we we got to keep on track here. So we're, okay. we're our time is up, and yeah. So we don't want to do the work of the enemy. We don't want to use gossip and rumor. We don't want to slander people. We don't want to shun people. We believe that there is a message that God has given uh, to this movement that is part of the sanctuary message, right? And that, is that is that the, a, a point toward the reason for the three repeats of diverse colors to show the three, the three steps? angels message? Yeah. Well, I, and this work. Yeah, and this would refer to Christ's character. Okay. This would refer to the garment of Christ's righteousness, if anything, not to something like the LGBTQ. Okay, so we're going to return to these last two verses tomorrow before we do anything in Judges 6. So are there any other comments or any other thoughts in today's study? Thanks for your patience and letting me speak my, my, my mind, what's left yeah. in my mind. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, well we have the... Uh... The comment blessed us blessed above woman yes so i'm just wondering we have that there also applied to mary right so i'm just wondering if there's maybe a connection there that could be looked at well well, well when you when you deal with that blessed above women so that would put this message on par with uh the message of of mary in relationship to christ because Mary is going to give birth to Christ, and this movement gives birth to a Christ-like character. That is kind of how we looked at it last time. Okay, so you, you did address Mary then? Yes, we did yesterday. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. So maybe we missed that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we addressed that, yeah. Okay, any other thoughts or questions? Well, the only other thing, just in response to what um, Angela says, I've heard this for years, not just in this movement, but people will tell other people that they can't talk to somebody because the person doesn't listen. But how would you know that if you've never actually talked to the person? They insist they have, Theodore. Oh. So somebody's See, actually. I wasn't there to witness it. I'm just taking their word. I'm taking your word and trying. Well, I often say the truth lies somewhere between. Yeah. Well, I just know. Uh, what is it? I had one person, I guess, maybe who talked with me because I listened to them for an hour without interrupting to them. But I, I wouldn't say that that's. Uh, and I don't know if this is the person. But actually, I hear this all the time. But nobody comes and talks to me. People don't engage me and and they will usually give the excuse that they're intimidated or that you know I'm, I'm going to shut them down or something like that but but that's just not the case i mean we haven't seen that have we i don't so, know so, what goes on in our private lives i'm not i'm, I'm not the even, vatican i'm not spying on you but, but i'm saying I'm even but I'm saying even publicly, have, have we seen anything that would indicate that that makes any sense? That, that's just my my question. Um, I'm sorry, I've got to take the phone. Yeah, okay. okay. Anyway, do you want to close with prayer, Dwight? Sure. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you 
for this study. We thank you for the conversations. We thank you for the points and the considerations that are given upon these verses. Help us today to consider this more fully. Be with each one that have been here today. Be with those that will see this later via the internet. Help us each one now so that we may understand that which we are seeing, that which we are reading, that which we are studying, so that we may draw closer to you and more carefully consider what it means to accept the robe of Christ's righteousness. Help us to this end. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.